Welcome everybody to our third Seed to Supper session for 2022. Um, just as a reminder, keep your mics muted and we will continue to use the chat bar um, for any questions and as well as um, the normal opportunities to speak out and ask questions as well. We have a number of facilitators tonight. Um, Judith is doing tech support and uh, coordinating the, the Zoom call. I'm facilitating again. Um, Brenda will be our chat moderator and presenters today are Peggy and Wendy. Thank you all. So let's start with a poll. Um, so Peggy is gonna present on watering protecting young plants and improving and protecting health, soil health, sorry. Okay, so the, I'm Peggy Dewar and I have been a master gardener since 2018. And the four basic things that, that your plant needs is uh, sunshine and water and a good garden soil to be able to absorb the fertilizers and nutrients from the soils. So um, that's why we suggest that you amend your soils before you plant. And um, the other thing that you need to do is to make sure not to plant too early. So a dry summer means that um, you're going to need to plant more often. Um, the types of, of watering are if you hand water, which hand watering is a problem because it doesn't often people have trouble watering deeply enough to be able for the uh, roots to intake the, the moisture. Usually when you hand water, you will need to water uh, so that it puddles up and then let the, let the water sink in and then do it again two or three times. Um, you're trying to actually water and think about how deep your plant is going to be into the soil because what you want to do is get to where the uh, water is soaking down to where it's soaking down at least six or eight inches. Where you first start out with the little tiny seed, uh, you're going to just water over the top of the seed and uh, wait for it to germinate and it's gonna have a little tiny root. So you need to make sure that um, as it grows that you keep it wet further down. Uh, some of your uh, radishes and stuff like that as they grow are, are not gonna go as deep as if you planted a potato and you need to get the water clear down. You need to think about when you're watering with um, hand watering that what you're trying to do is do the same as what a farmer does with his flood irrigation where he leaves the water on for hours. So that's the reason that you're gonna have to water more often. Um, Sometimes during the heat of the summer, you may need to water even up to a couple of times a day. Um, the problem being that uh, when, when you hand water, if you check your soil with your finger, your the 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 length of your finger it is your best measuring tool that you will find in your garden. And also, um, 
the, if you put your finger down in, in the soil, you will find out how well your soil is staying wet. There are different types of soil, the sandy, the clay, and the loamy. And depending on how your soil, that mixes in with whatever soil additives and fertilizer you add, that will depend on what your plants will be able to absorb. If, so, if you work on, on adding to your soil in the fall, you will be able to have a better soil to put it in. A lot of plants will react almost the same if they got too much water as if they don't have any water at all. So you need to water them on a more or less uh, regular schedule and check them probably once or twice a day. When, when you plant as seed, um, as in the beans or the carrots or whatever, like, like the small plants like that, um, you will need to water them and then watch as they grow stronger that they're growing deeper and then let the soil dry out a little bit between the waterings and you will get a better crop. One of my least favorite things to do is to get a nice row of carrots planted and have them come up and have the, have the tops looking like they're just doing well and be about five or six inches high. And then, oh my, it's time to thin. And you have to thin in order to remove some of the seedlings to give the remaining ones space to grow so that they will be stronger. So in order to do that, you end up pulling out what at the time you're doing, it seems like about half of what you planted. But that's what has to be in order for, for it to be a good plant. If you indeed uh, do <coughs> transplant, um, you, you can sometimes um, get your plants growing faster, but the problem with the uh, transplanting is that people get into big of a hurry to plant it. One of the uh, things that I've learned is that you need to wait until your soil temperature is about 50 degrees before you plant it, especially for um, peppers and tomatoes. If you plant earlier, you end up covering up the plant to try to help it out, and it still doesn't grow any faster than what it would if you waited another week or two. So if you water deeply and less often, you'll have a lot better plant than if you water it um, all at once. <coughs> Excuse me. You can use a hand watering method. You can use the hose with the water. Um, even though it will take less time, it will also, you will also feel like it will take next less water. But remember that you're trying to water something that's going to be, um, the water is going to be retained five or six inches down. If you use containers, the containers are going to dry out much faster. And um, ultimately, the plant needs about eight hours of sunshine a day in order to grow. I tried the watering in containers last summer and found out that the area that I was trained, that I was using, 
uh, was getting so much water that my plants were drying out faster than I thought they were because the containers had a pl were plastic and we uh, dried out the or warmed up the soil inside the pot. So if you keep the plant growing um, at the same speed, it will also deter some of the diseases that the plants get. Also, the thing that you would, another thing that you need to do would be to uh, put your tomato cages on your tomatoes shortly after you plant. So that um, because the plant is going to, <coughs> the plant is going to grow fairly fast as soon as the, uh, the weather warms up. Um, one, some people start planting earlier and, uh, one of the things that you want to watch is that your soil is dried out enough before you walk it, before you actually plant it so that the water, so that you don't rot your seeds. One other thing I would like to say is that you need to, to uh, if you're going to be away from home, you need to have somebody else tend to your gardening for you because uh, where, you're, where you're watering it every day, you're taking care of it. But if you're away from home, many is the gardener that has gone on a trip and come home and had it all dried up. So I think that um, other than to say that you should plant in the morning or the evening, because if you put your water around the base of the plant, it's going to absorb faster and you're, you're not going to have the problem with the leaves. So I think that would be what I would have for the watering. Okay. Fabulous, thank you. Um, I see that there has been some items in the chat. Brenda, are there any questions we might want to ask the group? That we were having a chat conversation about the types of watering cans and if there was one that was really recommended or not. I mean, there's some discussion, but I don't think there's a question that Peggy would have to answer unless Peggy had an opinion she wanted to share. I mostly done sprinkle irrigating or flood irrigating. So I'm, I, when I usually do it with the hose, I'm doing it into a container. So I haven't used the uh, sprinkling cans as much. Yeah, and sadly, oop, I did not mean to push through that, sorry. Um, Sadly, I've just kind of found out the hard way which sprinklers, I, cans, I don't like. Sometimes you just have to get them home and find out how they, how they uh, come out, right? Brenda's shaking her head. Yeah, it, that's just, that's the case. And some work on some plants and some, maybe they just pour out way too fast um, that they, they won't work on little seedlings, right? So sometimes it's trial and error. Uh, but I will admit there's been more than one time I have brought a can home. I've tried it and said, nope, and I've taken it and the receipt right back. So don't be shy. That's <laughs> what I would say on that one. I'm doing it. Okay. If there are no other questions, I guess I'll ask the group. Does anybody want to speak up and ask any other questions on watering? Nope. Okay. I will add this nice little clip. Um, of a watering can. You want a cheap, super cheap watering can, take your gallon watering jug and poke some holes and you can make it whatever size you want. And it's great for little kids because they can't, they can't spill it and they think it's super fun. Okay, Peggy, you get to continue on protecting young plants. 
Okay, so uh, the first thing that you're going to do is to harden off. And uh, harden off would be if you started your plant um, from seed in, in your house or wherever, or if you bought a start at a gardening center, but what you need to do is get the plant used to being out of doors so that um, it doesn't freeze or get sun wilt the first time you put it out. So what you're gonna do is put it outside uh, for a day, during the day, and then maybe even take it back in during the, or during the night and then back out again during the day so that it's used to being out in the weather. And um, a lot of times what I've had to do is to, that I would be real anxious to go get the star, the transplants and then, oh my, like this next coming week, this weekend, we're gonna have a freeze so, gee, it's not time to put it out yet. So you keep it in your garage and water it until it's time to plant it. Then I would take a, um, you can do a plant row cover, which I have never used, or you can take a plain old gallon jug and cut out the bottom of, the, of it or put it over the top of your tomato plant or your pepper plant and that will act like a miniature greenhouse so that it will protect your plant um, until it grows big enough that it will be able to be um, in the weather. <coughs> it also protects it from the insects that would come along. Um, that's one of the things that you'll be dealing with all summer is the different phases of the insect's life that will try to eat your plant before you get a chance to get the harvest. So there are many, um, there are many insects that will come along and try, or the birds will come along and try to gobble up your seeds. Um, one of the other things that you can do is to put out uh, some baits, such as sluggo, depending on if you have pets in your garden or little children, that you can put out some sluggo for the slugs or snails that would come along and try to um, help your garden out. And um, you'll have uh, aphids that you'll have to check on the bottom of the leaves for. You'll have uh, cabbage maggots and cabbage worms and tomato worms and oh my, all kinds of critters that will come to try to help out your garden. And so it takes a constant control and improving your soil to try to keep your soil from harboring the insects from the year before. You want them to, you want to have a good soil. Uh, a good soil will hold in the moisture and uh, suppress the weeds. So you're only gonna try to uh, turn over about six to eight inches of the soil in the spring before you plant because you want to minimize the erosion. <coughs> um, the other thing that you want to watch for is that um, tomato worms that are going to try to Eat your, eat your tomato plant, but that's not gonna happen usually until about in July. And uh, just generally kind of watch what's happening in your garden. 
to harden off, what, what you need to do is um, mostly just, just set it outside so that it's going to get used to being in the sunshine. If, if, if you think about what the climate is in a greenhouse, it's warm enough that um, it's in a moist climate. So what you're, what you're doing is taking your plant from a moist climate all the way around, that's all the way around it out to a drier climate. And that will make the plant more hardy. In the, in the spring, the, there's so much moisture in the greenhouses that the people in the greenhouses say that that's the best um, skin for their, for their own skin, the best moisturizer they could ever get to work in the greenhouse because of the amount of moisture that's in there. They, they, um, several of them have told me that that makes a big difference. Uh, if you add mulches, such as extra uh, garden soil or straw or extra soil, be careful where you get it from. Make sure that it's been sterilized. You can add a lot of different pests and seeds to your garden by where you get your mulch from that can add a lot of problems to the amount of weeds that you will have in your garden. Um, and you can also grow what's called a cover crop that you would plant in the fall and then you would work in in the spring to, be, to add nitrogen to your soil. We never used uh, anything other than um, cow manure and chicken manure in our garden, which we worked in in the fall, and then by the spring it has always it had always already worked into the soil, so we didn't need to worry about. Um, we never did compost pile; we just worked it into the soil. And you would plant your, your cover crop in August or sometime in August or, or through October after you had cleaned up your garden spot. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Brenda, how are the questions going in the chat? Um. I put in a bunch of resources in regards to watering, as well as some info on hardening off to supplement what Peggy was saying. Laura was asking about a powdery pest on gourd leaves. I'm thinking she probably means powdery mildew, which I think we'll probably end up discussing as we talk more about plant diseases or pests because it's so common. Yep. I think that you are right that that's up next. Any other questions in the chat or anybody have a question they wanna ask? Nope. Okay. So I've, I've also heard part of the hardening off is just getting those little plants used to wind. So they might've been, you know, grown in a greenhouse somewhere with very, you know, not a lot of movement. So if they're put out little bits at a time during the day, they learn to, be strong and kind of resist that wind, which is pretty cute. <laughs> and another thing I've seen, I think it was on one of the videos, can't remember if it was on one of the videos we showed or not, but um, even, even hardening off things and putting them outside and getting them used to some sun during the day isn't quite the same as putting them in the garden where there may be full sun all day long. And especially if you're planting on a little bit of a warm day as well. So you may want to put up a shade 
so they're not going to get full sun um, all day long is another thing that I've, I've done and seen people do in the past. Okay, well, how about we do some breakout groups and talk about your guys' um, gardening plans. So we thought this time focus on um, if you finished your gardening plant, planting plan, um, tell us about that. We talk about any concerns you had as you developed that or just in general and you know what kind of things did you take into consideration as you were developing that plan and specifically plant spacing, um, the location of the plants, the climate that might be needed or if you're doing container gardening um, thinking about sp appropriate container sizes. So with you, who is going to talk about weeding and insects. Yay, our favorite two things to talk about in the garden. What could be better. <laughs> okay, so what we're looking at here is, actually go, go back to some more. Okay. Um, photo on the left, this is just kind of, you know, just some, some images here get us thinking. It's a sunny herb garden that's in the yard of one of our master gardeners. Um, you know, full sun, nice edging, um, looks like some mulch in there. It's full sun from the south. Um, photo on the right is a giving garden at a local Corvallis church. And that's a location where we've been able to offer some summer workshops and hope to again in person. Um, okay, next slide. So what is a weed? Um, in a nutshell, something that's growing where you don't want it to grow. Um, some people would argue that, you know, there's lovely prized ornamentals that, you know, that's just not what they want there. So that could be considered a weed. Um, something that can multiply really well. Now we're getting into like what most of us would categorize as a weed. Um, something that makes lots of babies could be a problem. Um, something that competes with other plants. So on a patch of earth, there's limited resources for sun, water, and, and nutrients. So if you're trying to plant something deliberately there, and there's something else that sprouted up, then that's competition. And you, what you planted deliberately um, could, be, um, could be at risk. So next slide. This is, of course, an adorable. I, I grew up calling these uh, dandelions wish blows um, for kind of obvious reasons. You know, it's they're not not real troublesome. This is kind of a lighthearted slide here. But you can see the tip of each little hair sheet there is a seed. And each each one of those little seeds could, you know, could land somewhere and grow where it's not wanted. Uh, next slide. Okay. So invasives. There's a good resource here. Check out the link down below and we'll put this in your, in your materials. There are some things that in our area, we just kind of can't tolerate. Uh, because there's, there are some things that are just super aggressive and spread like crazy. Um, one example that I don't, that I don't think we have a slide of it, but uh, my neighbor has, we love our neighbors, but they have blackberries and they're not like the good native blackberries. They're just uh, like Marion berries. And it is a constant battle to keep those at bay. Um, here on the left, that is a California thistle. And on the upper right, there's some bindweed. Um, I'm not sure what the one on the bottom, bottom right is, but um, like I said, at this, at this uh, webpage, there's uh, really good information on invasives. And it's pretty hard to identify plants when they're young. 
sometimes it's not until they start blooming that we go, oh, that is, uh, you know, amaranth or, or something that I didn't intend to put there, which also is an, one advantage of if we do plant in rows, if it's outside of that row where you deliberately put a, a little seed, it's, it's probably a weed. Um, next slide. Okay, so triage. I would encourage you to, again, don't, at least this is my suggestion is to have a low tolerance for, especially invasives. Um, things that are going to seed. So it's worth, uh, especially early in the season, walking around in your yard or in your, wherever your, your garden is. You know, take the time to have your, have your cup of coffee or tea in the morning and walk around and, and just, and view. Um, and, do, and, and focus on early in the season, um, you know, the things that, that you really can't tolerate in your yard. For me, um, grasses, I've taken out uh, most, pretty much all of my lawn. <clears throat> and so if I see little grass, grasses sprouting up, that's the thing I can focus on. So the triage here, you know, kind of pick in your morning walk, pick what things are you gonna, are you gonna focus on and look for? That's what this slide is. Okay, a couple more March weeds. Um, does anybody recognize the one on the bottom left there? It has beautiful, delicate, teeny little white flowers. My nemesis, bitter crab. Kind of a, yeah, kind yeah. of a, <laughs> yeah. kind of a, it has a pretty little, like perfect circlet of, of little delicate leaves. Um, I call it shotweed. Um, if you let those little delicate flowers go to seed, which they do in about 30 seconds after the plant appears, I think. Um, if they dry and you brush up against it, those, those little seeds shoot several feet, I don't know, a yard. So they, that's one that I, that I watch for. Um, on the right there, a little hard to see in this picture, but that's a common one I see in my yard. It kind of looks like a, <clears throat> it's like dandelion leaves, but they're spiky on the edges, um, sharp on the edges and kind of pokey. Um, they make kind of cute little yellow flowers that turn into white little puffy balls of seeds. Um, that's one that I, that I go through and, uh, and try to remove. Um, and then the other one for me personally is grasses. So uh, there are, those can spread by seeds or by runners. Um, that's, that's how I, I see most of my grasses here. Next slide. Um, okay, so another, another couple here, I guess these are, these are grasses. There's, it looks like a little dandelion on the upper right. Um, on the left there, uh, that was, that might have been a compost pile that all the compost is gone. And Mother Nature cannot stand to see bare earth sitting there. So she's gonna, she's gonna put something in there. So um, in this case, it looks like it's kind of a, a mis, mismatch of, of uh, greens that, and we're not talking salad greens. So probably not welcome. Okay, next slide. Let's talk about controlling them. <clears throat> All right, so we've talked about water management. We're gonna talk, look at mowing, transplants, cover crops, landscape fabric. Uh, next slide, I think we should, we go into this in more depth. All right, so watering. Um, if you look at the picture on the left, there's a lovely raised bed, which is lush, and it has, looks like some nice drip irrigation in there, and it has mulch on the outside, which is not getting water, and it doesn't have weeds, so weeds need water too, so you can kind of control 
to some extent what what is getting water and what's going to encourage you know be a, a happy place for weeds to grow and on the right there that shows i think that's mulch around an orchard that's probably about a year old mulch um so there's there's a little bit of grasses and weeds poking through but looks very manageable to me that that would be really easy to go in clean that up and then put some fresh mulch on it and then on the edges that's an area that gets mowed so that's going to keep seed heads from uh, from spreading and okay so this is an example of how you can use a tarp so this this was a compost bin and looks like they're putting to putting it to rest maybe for the winter um, or maybe it's the summer and they want to heat it up but if that is covered with plastic or if you used um, thick layers of cardboard over an area that would also suppress weeds Okay, so tools. Um, you don't have to get fancy. People have their favorites. And generally you need something that's gonna dig. Um, maybe something that pokes. Uh, you're, you might want some gloves. Uh, good thick, you know, there's um, leather gloves are great if you're working with like blackberry brambles. Um, I'm pretty fond of those latex gloves that are a little bit, um, you know, have, have some surface on them that's a little grippy, but it's still delicate enough that I feel like I can, you know, pick pick items up and feel what I'm what I'm working with. So I brought some things here. So this one is one of my favorites. That's called a hori hori. And it has a little measuring little inches and centimeters on there, a serrated edge, and it's pokey, and then a cutting edge. Um, I forget what this is called, and it starts with an N. It's a Korean uh, hoe. So this is uh, pointy, scrapey. That's, that's a good thing. Um, this little guy, which can dig down and take out a taproot. Uh, maybe for dandelions. So can we take a moment and see if yeah, Hori Hori, a <laughs> shout out for Hori Hori. Um, let's hear favorite tools. What what thing what thing can't you live without? Do we need one? I have a question about the Hori Hori. I have not seen one or own one. So what are like the most common things you use it for? I use this for, um, well, so you can use it for measuring, you know, if you're trying to uh, plant something at a certain depth. I use the cutting uh, uh, for um, getting my pumpkins, you know, okay. cut, cutting pumpkins or zucchini, the, mm -hmm. the scrapey vines, um, the cutting I've used on a bunch of things too. And it's basically my trowel. Okay. So it is it is a little bit scooped here. Um, but I mean this is just this is just my and also it was a Christmas present, so that's also why it's a favorite. <laughs> uh -huh. But there's, you know, again, any tool that yeah. does the thing you need it to do is 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 a winner. Yes. I have the second one you showed. I don't know the name of it, but I love it. The Korean hand pump. Well, yeah, what do you what yeah. do you guys use that for? Like, how is that different with, than the trowel? It starts with an N. No, no goo. Um, so I use it. I do use it um, mm -hmm. for for clearing, uh, making roads. Oh. So this is extra nice and sharp. Um, I also use it the scraping in to clean off um, baby weeds mm -hmm. on the bed. Um, so like a hoe. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I use it for. Yep. I use mine the same way. I make trenches with it and then I'll use the edge to like bring the soil back on. Like if I'm planting carrots, use it to trench and then I'll use it to pull the soil back over the seeds. Oh, okay. Good one. Thank you both. 
So mine, I got to say, my favorite is none of those tools. It's the gardening gloves. (laughs) And, oh. the, and the kneeling <laughs> pad. I like, I won't even go outside without gardening gloves. And I love to garden, but I always have them on because then my hands are clean when I come inside, especially the kind that, that Wendy's talking about that's got a little rubber on them mm-hmm. so that you can get your hands dirty and wet and not get them soaked through. Um, and I've got a kneeling pad that I'm going to have to buy a new one this year because it, it's just, you can just s- sit on the ground. Or, you know, get down there and not feel like you're bending over and getting dirty. So I like all the metal tools too, but those, those are the things I couldn't possibly live without. And you can oh. throw those garden gloves in the washing machine too. Yeah. 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 Really? I, I have yeah. to sing the praises of the Hori Hori because it's basically the only tool I use now. Um, I got one. I had never heard of them before. And when I did my master gardener training, I got um, my kids to buy me one for Mother's Day. And they said, Mom, you're so weird. You want a knife for what Mother's Day? <laughs> but, um, I, and, and it's the only tool basically that I use now. And um, I use it for weeding. I use it for planting. I use it for dividing plants. Um, it's just a very versatile multi-purpose tool. I should have added um, some kind of oil. So uh, another good tool that goes along with all these, you know, very metal ones is uh, having a, I forget what the oil is called. When we're um, before class is over, I'll go and grab my oil. It's like a general, general purpose. But anyhow, um, no, you, oil. use the. Wendy. Thanks from uh, I don't think I don't think it's a mineral oil. Anyhow, um, it's a good thing. So you you know if you do come across a favorite tool, and uh, you can give it a little rub down with oil um, after use, and and keep it keep it happy for a while. Awesome. Okay. I have one of those uh, root slayers. Does anybody else have a root slayer? I've heard of those. Yeah, they're really great. They're really sharp because I have um, a big oak tree in my front yard. And so if I ever want to plant anything in my front yard, I've got roots and it's like a lifesaver. It's Mm well-named. It is, and it's dangerous. (laughs) Okay, so we've talked about some weeds. Um, we we can we've already we've talked about watering. Uh, kind of it all comes full full circle about learning how to grow a healthy plant because a healthy plant is one that's not competing for resources. Um, that's your best defense against pests. Um, and here in your, in your book here on chapter five has all kinds of good stuff about pest management. Um, next slide. Okay, so we're gonna talk about prevention, mechanical or physical controls, biological controls or controls and chemical controls. And the way we're starting at the top, the you know least, uh, the least intervention that you have to do. And then it, it kind of gets more serious as you, as you go down. So next slide. Okay, so prevention. Again, know your garden. Um, walk around, observe, monitor. Um, knowledge is power here. Know what things look like. Know what your healthy plants look like. And you can recognize if something is off. Um, catching, catching any kind of issue early is um, much easier to deal with. Um, and as has, uh, was suggested before, look under your leaves. Uh, you know, the little, if there's any little buggies in there, I'll use the non-technical uh, term of bug, which is not a scientific term. Um, there's those that live in leaves. You know, very few are going to be hanging out uh, in 
in plain sight, just, you know, not uh, just teasing you. They're, they might be hiding. Um, next slide. All right, so plant diseases, there, there are many. There, there's a big diversity of what people are growing in their gardens. Um, and there's all kinds of things that can afflict those. So um, OSU Extension, there's a, a number you can call in. There's an email address. You can send your question to with photos and your good notes. Um, so it's a really good uh, resource. Next slide. Okay, tolerance. We have, everybody has a different feeling of what's acceptable in our spaces. Um, for me, the only place I'm gonna find perfect is in the dictionary. It's not gonna be in my yard. It's not gonna be what I put on the table for dinner. Um, some of the most magical gardens personally I have seen were not picture perfect. Bugs and pests exist in my garden and they will in yours. Um, some are bugs that we welcome. Others are more a little bit of a pest. Some are a great deal of a pest. Um, so, you know, be, be, have a tolerance. This is a picture of kale that has been chewed on or some, some kind of brassica, um, chewed on quite a bit. Maybe this is okay. You know, there's, I bet you if you tip that little leaf over, you're gonna see some tiny, tiny little green worms. Maybe it's okay, you brush them off and you live with that. Um, so, you know, you, everybody has a different tolerance, I'm saying. Um, next one, next slide. All right, so physical controls. Um, removing the problem. Um, again, the previous slide had what I'm assuming is a kale. Flip that leaf over, there's little green caterpillars. Pick them off, they're easy. Uh, especially when they're little, just brush them off. And then they don't, they aren't super mobile. You know, the uh, beautiful little white moth is what put it there and, and laid the, the little, um, yellow seeds, you, you can actually brush those off if you catch that before they hatch or uh, transform into a little caterpillar. But if it's a caterpillar, brush that off and they won't make it back up there. So that's, that's an easy thing if you go out there once a day, that's, that's a physical control. Um, kind of the first line of defense. If, so hand picking, that looks to me like a tiny little slug on the left. Um, unless some, somebody else wants to chime in and it's something different. Um, a strong stream of water can also be very effective. Um, the aphids on my rose bushes, I'll go and get you know, a good strong stream of water and they don't hang on very tightly. So you can spray them off and they, those ones don't come back. Uh, not super mobile. Um, I like the shiny objects. I think probably most people would guess that the shiny object is not for an insect, um, although I could be wrong. I'm, I'm guessing that's for birds. Uh, barrier, there's a nice little row cloth there that's protecting whatever's growing there. Um, and then that uh, chicken, chicken fencing. Um, that could be really good if you have neighborhood cats that are just, don't leave your garden bed alone. Um, it's no fun to water if there's neighborhood cats that are also sharing your garden bed. Um, so again, physical controls, this is a, a great thing to start with. Um, also fencing. So if you have deer, you might need some very tall fencing. Um, I would add, Maybe crop rotation actually uh, is a physical way to, um, you know, if you plant something in one place and it has a pest, if you move that thing next year, that's, that's a, a physical control. Um, biological controls, here we're getting a little more complicated. Choosing uh, 
disease resistant varieties. Uh, so just right off the bat, setting yourself up so there's not gonna be that much of an issue with disease or that plant. Um, planting marigolds or nasturtiums, as Laura brought up in her lovely garden. Um, those can be pest like magnets. In, I mean, I, people use those as an attractant. So uh, they're so yummy and luscious that pests will come on them and leave your garden alone. Um, also planting flowers that attract, attract beneficial insects or predators um, like my um, yarrow, which um, I have near my apple tree because it attracts parasit parasitic wasps that in theory uh, are gonna go and uh, bug the little coddling moth caterpillar. Um, okay, next slide. I think we're on chemical controls. Oh, okay. This is just a, a adorable picture of a praying mantis, which we do have in our valley. Um, I've seen one in my backyard. Um, I've seen a bunch elsewhere. Uh, Goss Stadium there for ball games. I've seen praying mantises. Uh, so, and this is a super welcome thing because these are predators and they are voracious and they do just lovely things in your garden. And you can buy praying mantis, um, you know, little bundles of them at different uh, garden stores. The thing about them is that they're territorial, so they have a territory. So if you buy a bag of these, um, you wanna be sure and disperse them, you know, pretty far away from each other. So otherwise they'll, they'll eat each other. So if you want, if you're getting them to take care of other pests in your yard, then get not very many and put them very far apart. That's super cool. And next slide. Okay, so now we're getting a little farther down in our, our controls here. So chemical controls. I think this is a, if all else fails, not my not my go-to, um, but there are times that I have put sluggo out, which is iron phosphate. Um, if I had, you know, couldn't get on top of the slugs, um, I guess it could be a physical control. My my scissors uh, could be a physical control for slugs. But chemical, so sluggo, um, dish soap. You can have. Um, there's, you know, there you can mix dish soap with water and spray that. That would be considered a chemical control. Neem oil, which is, that's an insecticide mixed with water and soap. Um, with chemical controls, know when and how to spray. Um, that's, that's the main thing. Um, because we want, if you're having a pest in your yard, you know, and you have tried other ways to control it and you're, you're looking at your chemical controls, um, you want to make sure that um, you're just you're just looking at that thing that's bugging you and not harming um, the rest of the stuff in your yard. Um, <laughs> I like this slide. Again, <clears throat> everybody has a different tolerance. Um, I think this is this is lovely. A good summary. Um, you know, we're growing stuff out in nature, and the Part of that is um, there's there's bug life out there too. So I think are we at okay okay so what we're going to do is <clears throat> I would like this to be audience participation. Please use the chat here, and we're going to just pretty quickly here look at um, a series of slides. And there's gonna be, we're, I'm gonna ask you to put good or bad. Is it good, good bug or bad bug? And again, bug is not a scientific term here. So you're gonna, you know, forgive me on, on uh, being a little playful with that. 
And don't be shy, please. Throw it out there. Okay, ladybug. Are we getting are we getting chat answers? <clears throat> You're getting good. Right. Good, <laughs> good, good, good. Yeah, so good bug. Good bug. I agree. Very and in fact, in this photo, um, they're actually um they were literally eating aphids. Um, the one on the left that looks like a uh crazy um uh, to me, not an attractive creature, that's the larva. And um, it grows into a ladybug and it eats aphid. So super good. I freaked um, out. I got to say, the first time that I saw a ladybug larva in the yard, I thought, oh my goodness. But they I don't look, they don't look like what you'd think. But I have this no. cheat sheet that has good bugs on one side and bad bugs on the other, laminated sheet. And I went and found it and got very excited when I realized. That yeah. I had the they look gnarly and uh, you can actually find them later in the season. Um, they'll kind of curve up and attach themselves to the side of a leaf or the underside of a leaf. And that's when they're going to transform into the ladybug. Um, so something to watch for. Um, here, the bottom, I wonder if anybody else wants to um, comment. I uh, believe it was Elizabeth a couple years ago said that she sprayed a combination of whey and yeast on plants to attract ladybugs. Has anybody tried that? I have not. I think I think if you plant flowers that make pollen and then if you have aphids, you're gonna see ladybugs. Okay, next slide. Okay, this one is named in a not <laughs> bad, bad. I agree. Cabbage worms. Um, can you, yeah, you see where the cursor is going? It looks like the vein, like the central part of the leaf, and it's the caterpillar there. So again, a lovely white moth, um, but not something I really want to share uh, my yard with. And right there, yep, they eat holes in leaves. Row covers were great and hand picking the worms. Is there uh, anything uh, other than hand picking? Because I saw Brock's question there. If you have a lot of cabbage, that could be a lot of hand picking. <laughs> yeah, so there, the comment prevention is about stopping the mouse, the moths. So the, the little caterpillar doesn't get there unless a moth has laid an egg on the leaf. So if you wanna prevent the caterpillars, then you have to have some kind of barrier. And it could be just real, um, you know, real tightly woven cloth that is just for a, a short period of time um, to keep the moths from, from finding your cabbage. Can I show a picture? There we go. Okay, next. Okay. Okay, green lace wing. Mm. Good. Good. <laughs> Bad. <laughs> it's cute. Ah. So this is ready. Let's see. It's good. They have light green bodies, large clear wings. They the adults and their larvae eat aphids and other insect eggs, spider mites. Uh, so they're, they're a great thing to have in your yard. And again, plant flowers with all of these actually, plant, plant flowers that produce pollen and nectar. That's how you're gonna encourage the predators that are gonna uh, have an impact on the, on the bugs we don't want in there. Hey, flea beetles, see the little red arrow on the tiny little thing? Bad, bad. <laughs> Has it, have people in 
encountered these? I have. I had just one. What's that? I said maybe I all the I had one holes year. Away. Oh, <laughs> yes. So all, all the little holes are a clue. Um, they are. I one year I had these on one patch of my. Um, I think they were on my broccoli, and they do jump like fleas. So, uh, and they absolutely come in and cover a plant and just eat it, eat holes like overnight. They can almost take out a small plant. Um, controls, plant large healthy transplants. So instead of trying to put little vulnerable, vulnerable things in there, if you know or suspect flea beetles are gonna be a problem, start with big healthy transplants that um, they have that head start and are not gonna be as vulnerable. And again, floating row covers. A centipede. That are humans. Ouch. Okay, so I'm I am getting in question marks. It does sound like people maybe suspect it could be a predator. Let's see. Good. So these are definitely, they're hunters. Um, I love to see them. Uh, this would be maybe another, another time that Candy's happy she has her gloves on if she's digging around and sees a, a centipede. Um, they also help decompose soil. So not only um, are they eating, and they even eat little slugs. Um, so not... There's not a whole lot of things around here that eat slugs, but this is one of them. <clears throat> How to attract them, keep a compost pile and practice low-till gardening. So don't, don't stir stuff up too, too badly. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, let's go to that slug one. So this, I imagine this is a little pool party with beer um, that somebody set up for them. Okay. So across the board, people know these are not super welcome. Um, they definitely eat. Uh, I see slugs on my strawberries. That's kind of the, about the only place that they, they seem to bother my yard. Um, they do like to hide. Hand trapping, um, beer traps, like this one, a shallow bowl with beer can work. Um, also, uh, they like to hide in dark places. <clears throat> and, and so if you put out boards or cardboard, uh, that's what the trap boards are here. Um, then you can go out and lift those up during the day, pick them off, grab your scissors, wh whatever you need to, to get rid of those. So that, that could be um, very, uh, very successful. That might be it for good. Oh, oh, yellow jacket. There's a few this. more. There's a few more in here if you want to do them. I, how are we on time? We are doing okay. If people want to keep going, we can get through a couple more. Okay. Oh. Okay. So surprisingly, um, they're not beloved. They're not you know, super warm and fuzzy insects, but they do eat caterpillars, flies, grubs. Um, they are, they are predators. So um, I would not do the bottom bullet personally in my yard, how to attract. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunities for um, thriving yellow jacket populations with me, without me attracting them. I think that's kind of a funny bullet, but definitely agree with the next part. Leave nests alone unless they're interfering with the lives of people. Um, aphids. Good bug, bad bug. Again, not a technical scientific term. Horrible. Bad. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're not super welcome. Um, there's different aphids. There's some of them are 
uh, green. Those are, those are the ones I find on my roses. Um, there's little black ones, kind of depends on the plant, what kind of aphid is a, attracted. Um, they do, they suck the juices right out of plants and weaken them. Um, again, grow strong, healthy plants. Again, watering, soil health, good environment is gonna make stronger plants, which makes them more um, resilient. Um, encourage ladybugs and lacewings. Again, uh, you can buy ladybugs and lacewings at garden stores and try, you know, putting them in your yard. Um, spray with hose, that's what I do, very effective. Or insecticidal soap, if you're just really, you know, feel like you're losing a battle. Cabbage maggots. With a lovely little name. Yeah, I think probably if the common term is maggot, then it's not something that you're going to want in your yard. Um, they're tan or white. Um, they're, I think, pretty small. You'll see them literally on the roots and uh, bottom stems of something in the cabbage family. So um, cabbage or broccoli, um, and they stunt growth. So they're really hitting that plant at the very beginning um, and stunting growth. So um, crop rotation is good. Remove plant debris in the fall, and you can use row covers on young plants. And get rid of wild mustard in your garden. That, that, one, that one I hadn't heard of. It, is, it attracts them. Okay, the minute pirate bug, or minute? I say minute. Pirate bug. Enthusiastic good. Got lovely, lovely markings on there. They're oval, yellow, orange, or brown. Um, the adults and their babies feed on corn earworms, aphids, spider mites, um, all kinds of stuff. They are definitely hunters. They are voracious, so they are welcome in my yard. I think this is our last one. Okay, cucumber beetles. This is a great example of how it's hard to tell. There's so many insects. We live in a wonderful, diverse world with tons of insects and it's hard to tell. Um, Candy has a fabulous guide. Uh, OSU Extension has fabulous guides. There's links. Um, we're gonna be sharing on uh, ways to identify, you know, the things that you do want in your yard and the things that you probably don't want in your yard. Um, this, it's a green ladybug with black spots and they, they eat up our veggies, so uh, not welcome. Anything with a vegetable in the name seems bad. That's a good observation. I'll try it. Now I'm gonna have to think if there's one that does not. Um, so one, one other quick rule of thumb, again, not scientific, but if it's a fast creature in your yard, a fast bug, it's probably a predator. Um, you know, think slugs are real slow, aphids don't move around much, centipede is fast. So if it's something that is really scooting around, it's probably hunting and probably okay. Mm -hmm. I hadn't heard that one before. It's interesting. Okay. Well, awesome. I am missing a slide that says question and answer here. So we have reached the end of the presentation. I think Brenda, I would ask, is there any questions in the chat that we want to, to cover? The only one that didn't get covered has to do with, has anyone used slugs for fishing? I did a Google search and it said yes. But That's I really interesting. It. Like, are they good for anything? You know what I mean? <laughs> Bad idea. I mean, a worm, a slug. Chickens love them. If you've got chickens. Chickens. Um, oh, yeah. Or ducks. There ducks. ducks. Or ducks. Yeah, there's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so, like, do they, do they have a bad rat or them. something? Like, there's got to be something good to use for them. Yeah. <laughs> and Cheryl, I put that link in there just for you about the OSU bread dough study showing how slugs really go after bread dough. Mm. I know how much you like to put beer in your garden. Now you all have an alternative to beer. Yeah, save the beer. <laughs> nice. 
Nothing like those slugs. Okay, well, awesome. Well, I thank everybody for attending tonight. Um, if you've got any other questions, keep putting them in the chat or, or drop us an email. Um, we do have one more session coming up next week, and that is really going to be focusing on what do you do once you've been successful and have this garden and have all this produce. So we'll talk a little bit about um, harvesting, storing things, um, maybe talk about some recipes, et cetera, next week. So a little bit different twist, um, but that is one thing to kind of think about as you're planting your garden, because we've, we, when we started talking about things that we plant, think about it, a number of us talked about tomatoes and how many we planted and, and the list could go on and on of, of what you, what you plant, you get a little um, overly enthusiastic at the beginning, and then you end up with all the stuff at the end. So what are you going to do with it? So that's really something that's worth kind of thinking about. Like I look at that eggplant there, like that's a lot of eggplant. What are you going to do with those? Um, turns out I, I uh, cook them up and freeze them and they work just fine if you're going to put them in stews and sauces and stuff later. But those are the kind of things to, to talk about and we can share ideas of what to do with our, with our bountiful harvest. So before we do leave, I will open it up one more time. Any last questions or thoughts from anybody? Does anyone have any last minute advice about um, carrot rust fly, the one that makes the little like brown tracks in the carrots? All I mentioned in the chat was kind of row covers, things to keep the fly out as being a primary management, but any other thoughts? I haven't experienced those. Leaf miners weren't covered, but those have really been a pain in my butt. But row covers help for those too. That's what we used and that kept them out. Timing, knowing when to put them on mm -hmm. helps.